Okay, good. Oh, so you 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 were starting to tell me about when you were a little kid and your mother died and you were. Yes, and uh, uh, my brothers were both away in the war. Arnie was in, my oldest brother Arnold was in uh, in uh, Germany, and my brother Wally was in a Japanese prison camp in Japan at that time. And then my mother died. There was that was the family was gone. My mother was the family. My dad was in Los Angeles. Uh, my brother and dad had divorced uh, uh, early. Not early, but they had been divorced. Uh, <clears throat> why am I talking about this? You were saying that, because you told me how you got choked. into boxing. Oh, boxing, right. Oh, yes, when I started training, that was it, uh, where I learned to train. And uh, I was uh, homeless, living uh, under a loading dock behind the Corwin Churchill Chrysler Plymouth dealer. Uh, that building is... The back of it faced the Great Northern uh, Railroad uh, yard, where the trains would come and stop at that uh, that loading dock and unload cars. And uh, there was room under there, and I made myself a little apartment under there. See, and uh, I lived under that loading dock for about a half a year until winter came. But I was literally homeless. But what saved me? I was I was uh, you know, we're talking about Northern Pacific Avenue now. This is NP Avenue that parallels the tracks. It's the, it's the uh, low end of Fargo. It's a small town, low end. You know. And uh, NP Avenue was industrial places like the place I was telling you about, the car dealership. And then there was a farm machinery dealership next door there with their loading dock onto the tracks back there. And it, uh, NP Avenue was, a, was just about the first street in Fargo, well, once the tracks have been laid across from Minnesota into North Dakota, the crossing was right there. That's how Fargo came into existence, and NP Avenue paralleled uh, the tracks. So that was where I was uh, hanging out, in the industrial area, a lot of bars, and uh, a lot of unemployed uh, farmers, farm hands, as the small farms were being eaten up by uh, the big corporate farms. Uh, the traditional farmhands that uh, ran those farms were, were displaced, literally never to get work again. And they, they ended up on NP Avenue, <laughs> living in little rooms and yeah. seedy little hotels. So there I am, uh, uh, wondering what to do for the first time on my, on my, on my own. Mother died and everybody, uh, when the smoke cleared, uh, there, there I was without a home. and. Uh, there was a Wallace's Tavern. Now I'll get to the story. I had to create the setting of this. But a Wallace's Tavern was on the corner of NP Avenue and 5th Street. And a guy named Abe Wallace ran that. He was a retired boxer. And he was trying to well up. Yeah. Very emo emotional for me. Forgive me. It's okay. Ugh, uh, that's so stupid. Uh, but uh, Wallace, in his basement, uh, set up a ring and uh, some punching bags, training equipment and stuff, and he'd take kids off the street and give them boxing lessons. And that, he, that was his, his way. He took his boxing money and, and, and opened that bar. He invested his boxing earnings in that bar. So God, he had been there forever, you know. And uh, his bartender was, as a sideline, was named Al Jolson. <laughs> that was when I learned about Al Jolson, as a kid, you know, it's from, from the real, from, from a real Al Jolson. But uh, he took kids in, and I was one of them. Mainly I went in to get out of the cold. In the winter back there is very severe, see. So you're running around as a kid, a homeless kid, and you can go to the Greyhound Bus Depot, which is across the street, and hang out there playing pinball machines. You go to the YMCA and hang out there, swim and stuff. Or you could go to Abe, Abe's place and box in the basement. <laughs> and Abe was this wonderful man. He was, uh, for, I, I'm choking him up. I just, I haven't, I've never talked about this with anybody. It's hard, it's a hard, hard uh, memory. But uh, Abe was a truly fine man. He truly was trying to help homeless kids and stuff. And I was one of them. And he gave us really good training. He taught me that there 
miss such a thing as learning. That was where I learned that you can learn things. You're not just stuck with your brain the way it is. You can actually learn things. See? And he was, he, I was learning how to behave in the ring. And uh, you say, well, what can you possibly learn from, uh, uh, you know. But like Abe said, you can't hurt anybody if you try to hit them when they're moving away from you. So don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> He said, stalk them until you get them to settle down, and then you can hit them. See? Well, that is just incredible advice for a young boxer. And, uh, and then he said the, the uh, corollary to that is that you can hit them if they're coming towards you. And right there, you're not afraid of, of your opponent anymore. You want him to come. Without that knowledge, if they come, you get scared. See? You start running. You know? And with that knowledge, when they come, you say, that's the time to hit them because they're probably got their defense done. They, people, when they move forward, they drop their hands. And so, so he was teaching me this stuff, see. And it turned out, uh, I have very big, heavy uh, bone structure. Very strong. And uh, you can see it. And, uh, and uh, I, from the get-go, I had a hell of a punch. And uh, the, the, my sparring partner, he just tell me, you know, you're hitting too hard. You know, you know, please lighten up. Oh. I didn't know I was hitting too hard. So, uh, 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 in the stable of boxer that Abe had, he had three boxers who went out and represented uh, him, Abe in fights here and there around North Dakota. This is a small time, time. So this is in Chicago or New York. So. And uh, you mostly Friday night. Uh, Smokers, that kind of thing. And he had a, a fight scheduled. Am I going on too long? Are you sure? He had a fight scheduled in Wapaton, North Dakota, which was about 40 miles from Fargo, on the Red River. And uh, across the river, across the bridge, was Breckenridge, Minnesota. And uh, I don't know why I put that detail in there. But Wapaton had a, a cattleman's bar. And uh, uh, it was a big, cavernous room with faded green walls, you know, <laughs> just wooden booths with the paint chipped off and yeah. stuff. So it was really big. But it was the cattlemen uh, would uh, assemble there on Friday and Saturday nights. They're all drinking beer and having what they do, see. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the back room, they had a ring set up. So they had uh, Saturday night fights. And uh, when they could get a fight, that is. And, uh, so Abe uh, had a guy scheduled to fight there, and uh, and uh, his guy got sick and couldn't go. So Abe came to me and said, "Well, you've been wanting to get out and and try your try your luck. Here's your chance. Do you want to fill in for Strep?" And I said, "Well, sure, I'd be glad to. But am I ready? You know, he he had told me I wouldn't be ready for another year. Mm. I said, "Are you sure I'm ready for this?" He said, "Oh, you're just fine. There's no problem." <laughs> He said, there's no problem, see? And, uh, and his wife was the manager. Uh, when they went out on the road uh, to fight uh, Abe, and his wife was the manager, and then they had another guy, that was Al Jolson, the bartender, who was the, uh, he, he took care of the wrapping the hands and, and uh, the physical stuff. He had the pail to put on your stool and put the Vaseline on your, on your forehead and stuff. Very nice guy. And, uh, and he said, no problem. He said, and, uh, he said, oh, Charlie, don't worry about it. You know, your first fight is all spooky, but see, nothing to worry about. So we, we all piled in the car. It was, it was at least 20 below zero, and we're heading down the highway. And in North Dakota, in the wintertime, when it snows, the snow is sideways. The wind, the pra it's prairie, you see, prairie country, and there's always wind. The snow always goes sideways. And we're driving down the highway, and the snow is going across, drifting across the road. And I'm sitting there all bundled up, got mittens on and a oh. cap with flaps, you know, we're trying to keep where the car had no heater in it. Oh. <laughs> the four of us, two in front, two back. And I'm really getting scared. I think, Jesus Christ, this is actually happening. I'm going to get killed. I'm not ready for this, you know. I'm not a fighter. So, I want to go home. <laughs> And, uh, and all 
during this drive, they're saying, no problem, don't worry, Charlie, relax, there's no problem. And I'm saying, there's a goddamn big problem here. You know, about this. So we got there, and we pulled up in this place, and you could smell the beer fumes coming out the front door, you know, just, and, the, and the noise, the barroom noise, and, the, and I thought, Jesus, God, this is getting worse by the hours. And we walked the length of that room, through the whole room to the back room where the where the ring was set up, see, the ring room. And then through that room into another back room, which was the beer storage room. Cases of beer and uh, kegs of beer all stacked up. And that was the dressing room, see. <laughs> I just I pulled up a, a, a case of beer. That was the stool I sat on. <laughs> and Fred sat on a case. And I had my hands <coughs> on it. He wrapped my hands. And we're sitting in this little room with one dim light hanging, you know, in a cord. It was, it was so archetypal. Yeah. Am I going too long? No, keep going. This is a great story. Oh, well, it gets better, actually. <laughs> but I'm so, I'm so long-winded. You should just tell me to cut it short. But uh, so I'm getting fixed in there, and, it's, and guys are coming in with, with uh, dollies, wheeling 